Good morning. Good morning. Um, Dr. Francois Pomeray. I'm Francois. Tashuam. Tashi. You know, you do not need an introduction. You're such a familiar, well known person here. Now, to the intellectual, scholastic, academic world, you are a well established scholar and um, well respected. In the Buddhist Himalayan world, socially here in Bhutan, you are a familiar, visible person, loved and respected by your friends, colleagues, and students. But we want to know a little bit more about you. You were probably born in France, lived in the Congo, went back to France. How did the Himalayas and Buddhism in particular become your point of focus? And that's what you brought us to what brought us to us here in Bhutan. Could you tell us a little bit, a lot in here? Tell us <laughs> everything that we need to know everything. about you. Okay, okay. I'm not sure it is very logical. All these things are not very logical. Yes, I was born in France uh, from a father from West France and a Corsican mother. So two different cultures at mm. that time, really two different cultures. My father had never eaten oil, olive oil before he married my mom, uh, or rice, by the way. Mm. So, I w but when we were, when I was six months, I went back with my parents to Congo because my mom and my dad had been already living there in the Brazzaville, Congo Brazzaville, which was a French horrible imperialist mm. Congo, colonial Congo. I, I didn't say that. Huh? But I said. <laughs> So I was brought up in the Congo uh, till 17, till I was 17. So I spent all my youth in the Congo. That's why when I came here, it was so difficult to adapt to the cold mm. because I was used to live in the equator. Mm -hmm. And what was very interesting is I was living, of course, in the white world mm -hmm. in the Congo, mm -hmm. but also we had, I had classmates which were Congolese, African, and very, very young, I learned about different culture. That was very interesting for me. And also about the parallel world, what I call the parallel world, that the world which looks very scientific, very logical, and we, but has another side. And the Congolese, of course, like most Africans, have a great tradition of oral tradition, witchcraft also. And so I was brought up with that also. Mm. And plus my <coughs> Corsican grandmother, I just re remember recently, she was considered a healer. Mm. She knew how to take headache from people or take out curse. Oh, wow. So people will come and meet her and she'll do her prayer. Mm. Of course her prayer were Christians but it's all come into this magic parallel world, mm -hmm. you know. The other world. And when I went to school, we had, she always uh, stitch in my clothes, like what you call sunke, yeah? You know this? Mm -hmm. It was talisman. with prayer, mm -hmm. talisman, with uh, Christian prayers, mostly to Virgin Mary, because they were Corsican, so mostly to Virgin Mary, and I couldn't take it off. I mean, if I change clothes, I had to change it, but I couldn't wash it. When I wash, I had to take it out, you know. So it was very interesting. I live in a very logical, scientific kind of world. And at the same time, in, I knew there was a parallel world. Mm -hmm. So you think this was the beginning or the basis of you turning to the Buddhist Himalayas for I'm your not sure, no. focus? No, I don't think so. It, it helped me to turn to other culture, mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Himalayas, I, I really don't know. There are things which my parents tell me now, uh, uh, which might have been something, but for example, we were Christian Catholic, and at that time we don't do cremation. Mm. And I, one day, I believe I was four years old, I said, I don't want to be buried, I want to be cremated. Oh, really? Oh, my mother had a fit, mm -hmm. of course. 
So the supernatural or the parallel world or the other world yes. was always present there. I, I think so, mm -hmm. because I remember also my mom. I asked my mom once I came from school, I must have been six. I was in a convent, by mm -hmm. the way, like all of you. Yes. And uh, I asked my mom, from where do I come from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, well, you are our daughter. I said, no, 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 no. From where do I come oh, from? So here you would have been recognized as a reincarnate of some maybe, we are maybe some such thing. And uh, the few Asians who were, I remember the few Asians who were in the Congo, just loved me. I was their chichi. Oh, really? Yeah, it was oh, really, really interesting. Oh, really. So there wasn't a specific point in your educational journey no. that took you. So you trained as an anthropologist? No, no, I trained as a historian. Uh, and then I went to Nepal. Uh -huh. I was attracted to the Himalayas okay. as soon as I can okay. realize. And then I came to Nepal. I was <coughs> 17. Mm -hmm. And then Himalayas were there. And that's Just it. embraced you or you embraced the Himalayas? I don't know. Or I fell in the pot, whatever okay, you call okay. it. Okay, so let's get back to the book, the book uh, yes, The Divine yes. Messengers. The Untold Story of Bhutan's Female Shamans, co-authored by you, but with Stephanie uh, Goyer Stevens as the first author. Uh, and the book has been published re quite recently by Shambhala. Yes. You know, a very prestigious Buddhist publishing uh, place. And um, it's a highly recommendable book. Thank and you. I would like to congratulate you and Stephanie. And... Um, I find the book really engaging and it's a pleasure to read it because it's uh, what in doing this book you have what in Steph, in your own words, come out of the academic comfort zone to collaborate with Stephanie and what the product is an amazing seamless meshing of her excellent writing. She's a, a journalist by profession? Yes, she's a journalist, but she's an audio journalist. Okay. But she writes. Yeah, so she writes, she writes um, in a style that's very accessible. And that is such a, you know, two different worlds, as you say. The academic world and the everyday accessible world coming together. And I think it's a, it's a, uh, and it's on a subject that's so specialized, which otherwise only few academics would read. But yes. I think it's brought down to the average reader, and that is fantastic. So we will talk about the book in uh, <clears throat> as we go later in our conversation. But before we go any further, I think it's just the right thing to do is to recognize Stephanie and to honor her. So I'd, all I know is that she's an American who came here in 2011. How did you meet her? What was the point of the convergence of the two minds and the two persons coming together that you, could co that you collaborated to produce this book? This is very funny because I don't remember who introduced her to me or vice versa. But when she came to Bhutan, she was staying at the Yidzin mm. and she called me to meet me. Mm. Uh, she will remember because mm. she's fantastic mm. at that. And then uh, I thought she was just another journalist like I've met in my life and who are quite egocentric very often and trying to pull things out of Bhutan for their own good, you know, or their own fame. I will not quote anybody here. Uh, I will not name anybody. But I was, so I went like this, and then I found this incredibly warm, uh, friendly, but also sincere person. So I met Stephanie, and she was a warm uh, sin and sincere person. Mm -hmm. And that's what came through. Oh. Mm -hmm. She was really sincere in wanting to know, and she had come for another work here. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about Bhutan, like, mm -hmm. and I don't know how you must. 
she would remember. I don't know how I came on the subject of the Delum, lady who come back from the netherworld. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely fascinated. It's just like something had fallen on her. Mm -hmm. And for me, because I did my PhD, it was so ordinary, so I was blabbing around. And after that, she, we met again and again. And then for, she said, would you like to do a book? Then I said, oh no, it's too, too late now. And finally she convinced me because she was totally sincere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she had this very respectful approach to these things. Mm. She didn't know much about Buddhism. So this, for 10 years we worked together. Mm. And it has been a wonderful cooperation. She has been the most uh, obedient, mm -hmm. <laughs> obedient uh, student. Mm. She came to Paris when I was in Paris. So we worked sometimes for two weeks every day. So I explained things to her, Buddhism stuff to mm -hmm. her, which she doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And then she'll retranscribe it and she'll ask me if it, she has understood properly. Mm -hmm. Very, very respectful mm -hmm. and sincere in her. And really, then she interview other people mm -hmm. for the, mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was 10 years back and forth, and then the field work here. And then she wrote the book. She mm -hmm. wrote the book mm -hmm. with her great style. Mm -hmm. And then I read it again, then corrected. When there was something I didn't agree, I was saying, no, no, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Can't be. It's too mm -hmm. American. That yeah. was my. And she never got upset mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. She was wonderful. So it was, it was a very easy working style. And for ten years we never had a fight on good. anything. Good, good, good. So the, you say you don't remember, but um, I think in the book she mentions how she met you. I think she must have, coming to Bhutan, she must have a list of people that she had to meet. Yes, yes, yes. absolutely. And I think you were one, I think you were the first person she met because she talks about how she met you in the Yidzin. Yes. She was completely jet lagged. Yes, absolutely. And of course, she had come here for, I think, Renew to work on the yes. um, uh, empowering women and. Uh, with Her Majesty. Yes, and domestic violence with Her Majesty, uh, under Her Majesty's. Um, Renew, which um, empowering women and uh, eradicating domestic domestic violence. So I think it came as an you know, interest in the field of women as such. Uh. Yes. But uh, what uh, she says is, at the end of her meeting with you, she was completely overwhelmed. She admits that she had no idea of Buddhism at all leave aside something so special and specific as Delums. But you, yet you met and worked together with her. And in the 10 years of your very intensive oh, interaction, yes. I would say she's almost on the verge of becoming an expert in this field. And uh, you know, she was, as you say, she was a uh, great person, a great student to work with. And this is actually um, nothing new to you because you have mentored so many Bhutanese tertiary education level people and you have worked with them on specific subjects. So how was your experience of working with an established audio journalist writer as somebody, you know, a student coming through the system and working on the PhDs and masters with you? Was it very any different? Oh, very different. Very different. Because in Bhutan, uh, my students were young. Stephanie and me, we are, she's a little younger than me. Mm. So, but we are the same generation. So <coughs> it's different. Second, <coughs> in Bhutan, young students have so much respect mm. for their professor that, you know, they don't, they don't tell you all their problems. They feel shy. Mm -hmm. So you really have to extract them, the problem from them and see. And they tend to go much more by what, if I say, okay, you have to read this, 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 they will do it. But they might not look around. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Où, so, they have curiosity, but maybe the, the system doesn't allow them to open them to more, I would say, independent studies, mm. which is part mm. of, of our curriculum in Europe or in America. Mm. And <coughs> so that was very, very different. Mm -hmm. Of course, they know the culture, so it's much easier for many things to mm -hmm. talk. We can talk much mm -hmm. easily. I don't have to explain Sipe uh, Kaolo, yeah, mm -hmm. the wheel of life, mm -hmm. something so simple. Mm -hmm. I had to explain to Stephanie because she didn't know. So it's a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. We can, with a Bhutanese student, I can go immediately to another level. Mm -hmm. With Stephanie, first she was, we were same generation, so we had, and she's American, so we had a very frank, uh, and when I was telling her, oh, it's terrible, you can't write that. She accepted it. She accepts it and she laughs and or she will tell me, I don't understand anything about what you are mm -hmm. saying. You have to explain mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. which make me understand, understood that I didn't explain properly. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't understand myself properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with Bhutanese students, no, it was not the same at all, mm -hmm. at all. Thank you for asking the question. Yeah. So um, what I see is that she came with a very open mind, a learner's mind, where she was able to absorb everything, rather than the Bhutanese students who already have their preconceived understandings and conditions. So you had to be uh, conscious of what they came, where they came from, as well as they already had understandings of these conditions and things yes. like this. Now, I think this is a good time to actually, we should have talked about it already earlier. The title of the book is uh, Divine Messengers, the untold story of Bhutan's female shamans. Now, if uh, you could explain a little bit about uh, on this, the, just the title, because shaman is the larger category of all the different people and healers who who are in the parallel world, on the other world. But what is very special about this book is you have, um, you're talking more about Deloms. Yes. Or Deloks. Yes. Could you explain this phenomena and how does it happen? If you could just tell it in uh, a way that, you know, the person who's hearing it for the first time can understand it, not in an academic way. Okay, <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. Uh, first of all, if you allow me, I would like to explain the term divine messengers. Mm -hmm. We have in Bhutan and in the Tibetan world as la at large, uh, incredible variety of what I call mediator or mm -hmm. intercessor. Mm -hmm. But they are, these words are too complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, we have here, for example, to give some example, we have Nyenjom, Pamo, Pao, Terda, uh, Delom, Rizam, so many, uh, Labap, mm -hmm. so, so many. And in Zonka or in Tibetan, we don't have a word for it, for this category. Mm -hmm. As a, so you use the word shaman? No, we regroup them under the title messengers, messengers to call intercessor because they are between us and another parallel world, okay? Mm -hmm. So messengers and divine because they always get their information or their instructions from a deity, be it a Buddhist deity or a local deity. Mm -hmm. So that's the title, Divine Messengers. Okay. Okay. Now we wanted to focus, it's true, more on some of the people who had Delom experience, because I work on them for my PhD, and I translated in uh, Sangye Trezom, Delo Sangye Trezom in French. The English translation, by the way, is done by Richard mm -hmm. Whitecross. Mm -hmm. uh, very mm -hmm. well done. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a, we decided, and that this we concentrated on ladies. We know that there are 
messengers who are male, but we concentrate on ladies. And it happens that most of the Delo, Delo in Tibetan, Delom in Zonka, mm. are women, women, most mm. of them. Mm. And uh, even if in Bhutan, sometimes they are called simply Rizam, that mm. we explain. High in the, caste or something. Yeah, yeah. High, high birth mm. lady. So, uh, now, the Delom are people, or ladies in this case, who travel to hell. Do they die or not? That's one of the questions we are not answering. Mm. And they come back with a message from Chogigelpo, mm. the Lord mm -hmm. of Death, mm -hmm. for the living. Mm. And they describe to the living what is happening in the hell, mm. what is happening also in the paradise, but mostly in the hell, mm. because you, I don't know, human beings tend to go to hell. Mostly. <laughs> mostly, mostly. And mm. so you have extremely vivid mm. uh, narration of what the Delo see, why she's traveling in the hell. And then she comes back and she tells you, oh, your uncle is suffering under a stone, because he did that, you know, it's mm. quite, mm -hmm. quite frightening. It's quite graphic out there. It's yeah. very graphic, mm. and you can go on the Sipe or on mm. the Wheel of Life also, some of them are. And it is extremely interesting because it gives you a good, simple Buddhist moral ethics, moral mm. ethics on retribution mm. and karma. Mm. If you do that, you will do that, you will get that, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. so, it's not in complex Chuke form or anything. It's in the ladies are very simple. They speak your language, Sachop, Bumtanka, or, or I mean, Zonka. And they say it in very simple ways. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So everybody can understand. Yes. So they are important messengers for Buddhist messengers. Buddhist messenger. Okay. Now, most of them have features which are typical of shaman. Mm. Mm. That is, they are very sickly when they are young. Mm. They very often get mad, mm. Mm. mad, mm. Go run, off, yeah. walk off in the forest and mm. run off mm. when they reach puberty. Mm. Mm. Then they are recognized mm. by the community or by somebody as spiritual as messengers, and they have to take this role. I will come back on that. And then they do follow a certain diet, like all the shamans. They don't go in unclean mm. places, polluted, places. polluted yeah, place. Drip. Drip. Mm. Drip is terrible for them. So, and then they, they, they fall into this state, uh, say dying, but is it dying? They fall into this state for several hours, mm. uh, which is also typical of the shaman. Mm. Mm. So they have shamanic features, mm. Mm. but they don't, which means pre-Buddhist or non-Buddhist feature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this has been so well integrated into Buddhism that they don't really know it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. What they really, really, for them, they are Buddhist, mm -hmm. and they are mm -hmm. propagating the message of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. Now we have, sorry, I will be a little long here. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another category, mm -hmm. which we are talking about, which are mostly Nenjom and Pao, mm -hmm. and Pamo, sorry, mm -hmm. Pam, mm -hmm. who are invested, who have the same shamanic features, but they get their message from the local deity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is which are the pre-Buddhist deities which mm -hmm. have been integrated mm -hmm. into Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Dharma, yeah. The Dharma protectors, like this, you call yeah. them in English, in mm -hmm. Bhutanese you say Chuchong, Chesum, yeah. or Chesum. Mm -hmm. So each valley has one, for oh, example yes. here we have uh, here we are under 
Jack Pamelen, mm -hmm. uh, Guinean Jack Pamelen, mm -hmm. down Timpu is Tom Sang. Mm -hmm. Then we have Aptundu mm -hmm. in Ha, ha Paro mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. with Zol, uh, uh, Chichu Drake, mm -hmm. always fighting these two. And then we have all of Abuta. Mm -hmm. So these local deities get this woman uh, possessed mm -hmm. by them. And these ladies will, will again say a message to the living, to the people, but it will be mostly, uh, um, how to say, harmonious, how to live in a community. If there is a problem mm -hmm. in the community or in your family, how you can deal mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. So they are slightly different from Delo. Okay. They are more embedded into the local beliefs, mm -hmm. but we put them together because they are also and have the, the shamanic, okay. shaman traits. Okay. And that's why we call divine messenger, because either from the local deity or from Chucky Gyalpo, yeah, yeah. Avalokiteshvara. Mm -hmm. Avalokiteshvara is very often there. Yeah, because mm. Chucky Gyalpo is mm -hmm. one form of Avalokiteshvara. Of, of, yeah, yeah. So uh, these two, they, they are still transmitting something mm -hmm. to the people. Okay. So this I'm is not sure why I was clear. But no, no, I think you're quite clear and you explained in a way that we do understand why you have called, uh, you've named your book The Divine Messengers. Uh, what is interesting for me is, um, you know, we use the word dying because even in when we talk about the Delum, they actually die. Okay, she, 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 so you know, and um, the other shamans like the Paos, Paos, Nenjung, they go into a trance. Now, is that a difference between the trance going into a trance, which is just you know with a limited time, and Deloms and Deloks would die? For instance, I was just reading um, uh, this other Delom. Um, Dawa, Dawa, Durma. Dawa Durma. she said she used to die for five days. So what happens? Do all their vital signs go dead or is it a form of meditative, um, you know, it's state it that they go into or what, what is this? Okay. First of all, uh, it seems, but that can be also the literary embellishment. Mm. Okay. I've, uh, I've come to that also, maybe mm -hmm. conclusion, mm -hmm. that they say five, seven days, yes, eleven yes. days. And so every, every holy day, like and Namgang, holy, and yeah. all. they die. Uh, it's true that they die on holy days, mm -hmm. but in the, in the biography of Delong, because we have a lot, mm -hmm. they, they die for a long time, like mm -hmm. five, seven days. Today, we don't find ladies dying, dying so long. Thank um, goodness. <laughs> so long, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be, in the present world, it will be a few hours. Mm -hmm. I have seen some. They don't have a trance like the Pamo who mm -hmm. go like that, or the Nien Job, you know. They just sit, they put, a, there is a white cloth on them, and then they just boom, go, and they don't move at all mm. for several <clears throat> hours. But are they dying? Now, again, you can call that a trance because mm. they are not mm. really, but it's not a physical, Physi with a lot of, agi of yes, uh, yeah. agitation yeah. trance. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to tell about the signs. Uh, but I heard from some doctors, Tibetan doctors, that they could be, it could be like the Lama who go in Tugdam. <laughs> okay. Mm. They stop some of their vital sign, stop, mm. and then it comes, they can come back. They have the, the power to come mm. back. Mm. But the Namche, the Vijnana, the, the mm -hmm. conscious principle, mm -hmm. is still there. Okay. Is there. Mm -hmm. What would die is a vital sign, like okay. the soul, the la. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, when Guru Rinpoche came to Bhutan, he restored the sok 
the of vital principle of, of King, Sinturaja. Of yeah. Sinturaja. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that could be something. I, I am not saying it's true or not true. Recently, uh, somebody asked me, but is it true or not no. true? I say, I don't care. Mm -hmm. For me, it's what they represent in the society, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, that is um, what I find very amazing for you with your knowledge and experience and of your research into the world of these, uh, you know, extraordinary people. You're there, you have great respect, you have great, you know, you're not um, trying to prove it in a scientific way to dissect it and to, you know. And uh, what I find Stephanie comes in also very non-judgmental, just interact, uh, you know, just accepting. She's not judging. She's just accepting all these things as um, matter of fact. Yeah, as a matter of fact, as she's right it, as she experiences. And so, what I um, want to know is, you know, I think it was so much the influence of yourself. Of course, you're in it fully, as well as other scholars, well-established, well-respected, world-known scholars like uh, Samten Karme. Yeah. Uh, he, I think she, he had a meet, uh, she had a meeting with him and she says that um, he, he doesn't also judge, but what he says very precisely, and I just want to read what he said, he said, it's a place where human minds can go, where the interior landscape it's nothing like what we can see by ourselves. That's in page 109. It's so important to me. Uh, so S Stephanie came to these understandings. She respects these conditions and she works within that. But how much of you, like she was guided by some, uh, something Karmi, how much of you is in there is understood by how intensively you worked with her, how you have inputted into her understanding of um, making this book come alive. Now, you mm, have used the guidelines or the beginning, the origin, the nucleus of this book came from your own PhD thesis, which was uh, on Delum Sanghi Chandram you just mentioned. And uh, she was a she was lived. She lived in the 18th century. 18th century. You probably translated and just. Uh, interpreted it into French, which was later translated to English in 18, 1989 by Richard Whitecross. Yeah. You had all the knowledge. You were living in Bhutan. You knew about the present-day Delums here. Why, why did it take you so long to come out with a book like this Divine Messengers? Why couldn't you do on your own something like this? Because you had, the, you had all the work. And you were interacting, you were hearing about these Delums. What, what kept you? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I, first of all, when I finish a book or an article, it's the same with article. I don't look at them anymore. It's mm. gone. It's mm. past. Mm. I, I look for the, to the future. So, first, and second, maybe if I had lived in the West, I would have written a book. Mm another book myself but living in Bhutan every day and I'm not being humble uh, uh, or something like that no no I am just I just mean it the more I go the more I realize I don't know anything mm. and that is a huge uh, it came it really hampered me mm. it really paralyzed me that the fact that I don't know anything and it is really difficult. And the second thing is maybe I'm very shy of my English. So I say maybe I shouldn't write in English, blah, blah. Maybe my English is not good enough or something like that. Uh, but the most hampering stuff is because I was here and I feel that, oh, I don't know anything. That's the thing. Mm. Mm. So don't call me knowledgeable. I am not. <laughs> I know a little point. You are, you are knowledgeable. I've heard long-term 
Western people who live in Bhutan saying, if I was a consultant in Bhutan for two months or six months, I would have written a book, but I've been here 40 years or 45 years. I don't know anything. Exactly. So th I think it's something that a uh, lot of foreigners who have lived and integrated into the Bhutanese society feel there's so much more, whereas consultants come for a short while and they write a book or they because publish Because when paper. you come for a short time, mm. you get the superficiality of the, of the Bhutanese society mm. or culture, mm. which is very attractive. Mm. And you think you understand. But the more you go, you see there are so many, many layers. layers. Yes. And still today, I'm totally, uh, how to say, uh, frozen mm. by the amount of things I don't know. Okay. That's very, very humble of you. And no. I think people who, who claim themselves to be experts and all, I think they should really take heed of what you have been saying. You've been living in Bhutan for how long? 40 Back years. 40 years. Yeah. So but you've gone native. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, you know, you have um, researched, you've read many of the uh, books the, on the Delums. Uh, on, in total, how many are there about? Oh, we have about, which are well documented, means we have the biography. Mm -hmm. uh, there are about 15 to 16 biographies of Here them. in Bhutan? No. I you know, heard in, there's quite a few in the Tibetan library of... Uh, uh, yes, of mm. course, and in the West, mm. Leiden. Mm. And mm. now you can all download them from, oh, from sure. the uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, library online. Okay, so oh. they're in the world, the past world. Mm. Now we're talking about the Delums here. And I love the meeting of the Delum who's in Thimphu. And uh, Stephanie writes about going to visit the De, uh, Delom who relocated in Thimphu because she said it's much better business here. <laughs> Thimphu is much more active. I get a lot of more people coming to me. And they go to see her and she's in jeans and t-shirt and lipstick. And, you know, so she's really contemporary and alive with us, very realistic. Uh, you know, she's yeah. every day, she's there yes. and she's healing people. Because uh, Stephanie writes that when she went there and had her little audience or interview, there were already people lining up to come and meet this girl in jeans and lipstick and everything. So you cannot judge a Delum by or the a look. Purse, yeah, by the look. <laughs> so she is a Delum. Now, here it's still quite. Um, I think there was a time when these kind of um, shamans were looked down with the emerging knowledge of the West and what was the modern thing to do, what was the right thing to do, there was in fact uh, quite a lot of disregard and kind of a dichotomy between what is Buddhist and what is non-Buddhist. So they went through a phase when they were subjected to, to humiliation and even physical abuse. But now we are coming back to a society that's much more open and it looks like these Delums are being accepted in the everyday life. A lot of people go and consult Delums and think, uh, get their um, divinations and find messages from them. What is your personal take? Because you are, are a scholar who worked on these and you live with Delums. Do you think they have a place in modern Bhutan? Do you think they have some contribution to make in the healing world of healing? Uh, thank you so much for asking me this question. But uh, before I come to that, I would like to say, as a, Stephanie and me, we have a tremendous respect for these messengers. Mm. And these ladies are suffering. They have suffered tremendously in their life, in their body, in their mind. Their family has suffered till they were established. Mm -hmm. And to be a messenger is extremely tiring. That comes throughout in the mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say they are really uh, admirable, mm -hmm. admirable. Mm -hmm. So now to come to your point is, it's true that 40 years ago when I started doing my PhD, it was very difficult. People were really despising them. Uh, generally, 
uh, maybe we were in a more orthodox kind of Buddhism. I don't know. I don't want to judge. But this today, what surprised me is first of all how many there are, because we we have interviewed some of them, but there are very few, mm-hmm. including Nyanjom and Pam, mm-hmm. okay, Pamo, uh, who have a role. And how I, I say I can say that, it's because I see people queuing at their door. Mm-hmm. And they will go very quietly in Paro, in Punaka, in Ha, where we have been working, to get an appointment with this mm-hmm. lady is very difficult. Thank God for the phone now. Yeah. Because you you take yeah. appointment, mm-hmm. but sometimes physical distance is it's easier, mm-hmm. much easier. But sometimes you have to wait, and I, that's how I met interesting people in the waiting room, mm. telling me why they had come to see this Nyanjom, Pamo, Delo, and all. Because uh, they had personal problem, or they wanted to know something about the future, because they mm. do also mm. divination mm-hmm. with dice mm-hmm. or rice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say they like to come to them because it gives them a kind of, it's soothing, mm. it's soothing. So then I realize just that there m- might be something here we are missing in modern Bhutan. Mm. Because our kids are so, uh, how to say this? Attuned to the outside. Outside, and then we have an excellent health service, I'm not complaining about the health service, but we, because of our consultant we got, <laughs> we tend to see everything through the uh, uh, allopathic Western mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. lenses, even if we have a good um, traditional hospital. And people used to go to Lama, people used to go to these ladies, and they were doing a lot of healing in the community mm, mm, mm. and for the people. You believe in them or not, that's not my point. My mm. point is that their role is important for the community and for the family. Mm-hmm. So can we how somehow integrate them in the healing process mm-hmm. of contemporary Bhutan? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe women feels good to go to them because they are women most of mm-hmm. the time and it's easy to talk to them mm-hmm. so maybe they could we don't have enough psychoanalyst or psych- mm-hmm. psychiatrist mm-hmm. maybe this will be they could fill that gap you think may, maybe i don't know i'm not a doctor mm-hmm. doctor will be shouting at me but yeah. <laughs> uh, and i know very well one thing which worked very well uh, I know a young man, I knew a long time ago, a young man who is extremely successful today, who was v- mentally very disturbed when mm-hmm. he was 14, 15. Mm-hmm. And because his family was very traditional, mm-hmm. uh, they did mostly toku mm-hmm. and also saw Rimro and, and, Rimro and saw some healers. Mm-hmm. And this young and I was like a fool at that time. I said, oh, we have to take him to a hospital, mm-hmm. which is stupid. Mm-hmm. Because in his case, it worked. Mm-hmm. And he's a very successful Good. Good. young man. Mm-hmm. So um, I think this kind of this discussion, we could go on and on and on for days, maybe 10 years also. Yeah, yeah? God But knows. I think we have to stop let's here. Buy, let's and write I, another book. Yes, and we can't... Um, tell everything in the book because the readers will say, oh, I've already heard every, all the contents in the book, so why should I read it or why should I buy it for, you know, the publishers will be upset. So I think here we make a turnaround, Francoise, and this is actually, we are talking at the um, forum of the Druk Literary Festival under the Mount uh, Bhutan Echoes. So we should be talking a little bit about the literary Um, creative literary uh, activities that have gone on and you've been here now for 40 years so you will have the insider view 
as well as the professional academic or the objective outsider view of seeing how the literary scene in Bhutan has grown and uh, what have been the positive aspects, what have been the negative aspects. Could you just talk about uh, your experience? Because you're an academic, you're a scholar, but you're also a reader, I know, and very interested in uh, creative uh, writing as well as in fiction. So could you just tell us, what, where have we come? What, what, are, what are the uh, mistakes we've made, what would be the uh, simple, you know, some advice that you could give? Because, I mean, coming from your culture of the French literary world, world you know, how, I mean, we, I can't even expect us to be compared in some way, but just from, because you have the view of both the worlds, can you tell us, and talk a little, talk us through a little bit on that. But first of all, and that will be my transition to what you asked me, I would like to thank you for writing the foreword of the book because it is, for me, the best part of the book. Oh, that's, you're being kind. No, I love <laughs> very it. Very kind. And then you talk about the problem of, in a very, in your, your style, which is great. I ca that's why I'm paralyzed. I can never write like you. So it's, uh, it's such a great foreword and personal also. So, and uh, because you are also, a lit you are a literary person on the scene of Bhutan. You are, yeah, very important. You were the first to write, most, I think the first to write in English. Uh, publish. Publish in mm. English, yes, yes. Mm. So, and your book, you have a great style, and I enjoy all your books. But how, so you really launch Bhutan also as a country which writes on the international scene because your book have been published in French, in Italian, in other languages mm -hmm. and so maybe in Japanese also? In Japanese. In yeah. Japanese. So suddenly people who are interested in literature heard about Bhutan. Mm. So that was a very great thing. The second great thing I found for Bhutan, then I'll come to the less great thing, mm -hmm. was Her Majesty's uh, initiative, mm -hmm. Ashido mm -hmm. for the Literary Festival. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic mm -hmm. because it gave such an impetus mm -hmm. to sure. tear to mm -hmm. the young people to learn about other literature, India, but also Western literature. Uh, and <clears throat> suddenly, young people say, oh, I would like to write too. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. was really fantastic, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because as we know very well, traditionally, lay people, mm -hmm. unless they are historians, and even they were mostly monks or gongchen, don't write mm -hmm. in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have, and that's my downwards, mm -hmm. downside, such a poor, poor reading culture. Okay, exactly. I am appalled and I'm still appalled by, by when you go to a bookshop, even the bookshop, uh, I will not <laughs> mention name, names, name, but they have nice people here at the counter. And I come and I say, I would like so and such and such. And they look at me with round eyes and I think to myself, I think they would be selling peanuts. It would be the same for mm, them. Sure. Books or peanuts is same. When you sell books, you have to love them. Mm. You have to mm -hmm. advise. Mm -hmm. You have to be with your uh, client, mm -hmm. customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, my house is full of books like your house. We cannot live without books. Mm -hmm. And our, also our English mm -hmm. or French or German, whatever language, cannot improve unless we read. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it is very important. So the poor reading in Bhutan, I found people read what is ascribed to the curriculum. Exactly. And that's it. But slowly, slowly it's changing. Mm -hmm. I see young people mm -hmm. now becoming author themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and you have a, such a follower, mm. follower, so many followers, mm. people who have been mm. writing books, following your example. So that's the, that's the positive. Mm. Her Majesty work mm. and propagation of the literary festival now, which has be, become Mount Bhutan Echoes, which is very good, and then the young author starting to come up. Mm. That's great. Mm. Uh, mm. And they write on same, so many subjects which mm. are interesting, social subjects, religious mm. subjects, mm. so many. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say what is needed in Bhutan is good editor. Excellent. That's what I feel is the oh, biggest you feel miss. Also? Oh, yes. Book editor, because even us, we we had an English editor mm. for the book. Shambhala mm -hmm. has editor mm. who goes through the book and here we get, they get, we get back the book and they have changed this world or they have cut that and you have to put a big lid on your ego mm. because, mm. oh, but I like my sentence. Yeah. No, it's not a good sentence. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out. Mm. So you have to learn to be very humble when you mm. publish. Yes, exactly. And you have to have a very good editor. Mm. To uh, to help you, I'm mm. sure it happened to you, where mm. they say, oh, this yeah. is rubbish, cut yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. You have really... So books are a long labor, and it's not just, oh, I read that, I go to a publisher, and Bhutan, many people publish by themselves, self-publish. Self yeah. self but I'm just reading a book, which I will not name, very interesting book. But I wish there was an editor. Mm -hmm. Exactly. exactly. The person jumps from, it's about three people. The person jumps from the life of this person to the life of another person. Then I'm back with another. Mm. Okay. So you're really scattered. It's scattered. Mm -hmm. Because I feel it's written as it goes. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it in English, you know. You just, uh, you write like, like your mind is going. Yeah, the flow, uh, what is The flow. And what is it called? Stream of Consciousness. A stream of Consciousness. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Stream mm -hmm. of Consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's it. But mm -hmm. it's not a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yep. not a literary, I never say I have written literary work. Never. Mm -hmm. Mine are basic academic work, okay? Mm -hmm. No literary pretension. Mm -hmm. But in Bhutan, we have a lot of literary potential. Mm -hmm. But they need editors, yeah. and they need a lot of workshop in creative mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel. Okay, that's um, nice. I think uh, you, since you talk about the importance of editors, when you ask, when you send me the draft text for oh. my foreword, I got the draft with the editor's work on it. And, you know, all the time I was saying, if we only had an editor like this, if only I could get access to an editor like this, because the person who edited was very polite, very precise, but very, you know, focused oh. on what you would... So this is what we miss. She didn't and think, spare us mm, at all. Mm. So what we miss is editors and... Uh, that's the secondary part, but what we need, what we uh, miss here in Bhutan's young writers is some humility to say, to admit, look, I, what I write has to be improved by myself at the, this level and then go beyond and tell, let somebody read us and say, this is not correct, this is, you improve your language. Or things like so we need editors and how can we bring about editors is it because we need um, you know editors are not expensive but they can be expensive oh a good so editor financially it is the, the factor finance factor is there but also the ego factor because many people i find in bhutan who write feel that this is it this is the work you know it's ready for uh, to, for printing, I don't want anybody else to correct what I'm saying. You think we have to have a humbling experience, for instance? Well, I don't... Ego bashing? <laughs> I don't know. I can't say. I am nobody to say that. But uh, each time you go through an editor, a literary editor, 
certainly you go through ego bashing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you say, mm. oh, I thought what I say here was so nice. She said, ah, rubbish, you said it page so and so. Yeah, yeah repeat, exactly. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Oh, ah, I didn't realize. Okay. And there is also, but there is a lack of good editors in Bhutan. It's not a profession which is coming up, no? Mm. Do, do, mm. do we have? Mm-mm, not. No. Not many that I know of. I mean, I know I was, people who can correct my English, <clears throat> of course. I was fortunate in um, one or two of my books to have uh, editors outside of Bhutan, which was really help, which really helped. I think again, this is a topic that we could go on for. Uh, so before we conclude, uh, Francois, may I say any, something? Yes, please, sorry, please about please. literary scene in Bhutan. Oh, uh-huh. I am very impressed by the f- facilities the ease with sc- screenwriters. Mm. Mm. It seems eh, people are very uh, good at screenwriting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's another view, another part of the scene. Maybe we should look. I'm not a specialist. Maybe we should look at screenwriting mm-hmm. as a literary exercise, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and also. Sorry to say, but we don't have, unless I've missed them, good Zonka fiction writer. Is it? See, I don't read Zonka that well, so no. I don't know. No, but you know very well. Can you give me a name of... A, we have historian. We have good Zonka writing, but creative writing. Mm. Do you know anybody who mm. is... Mm. writing creatively in Zonka, unless, and I mean, I apologize, I may not know everybody, but uh, I don't know. So mm. I found it really sad, mm. really okay. sad. So somebody has to, uh, you know, Stop. pave the way, yeah? So I think um, as much as I would like to go on, I think, Francois, we have to conclude here. And what would be your final take on, okay, academic studies like this, which uh, you came out of your comfort zone and made it into a readable, accessible book, but also your take or your advice on, you know, you've said a lot, but uh, the improvement or the path forward to literary, uh, you know, improving or broadening the literary scene in Bhutan. Oh, uh, Besides good editing and... I'm uh, not the person uh, I'm not the person to say anything because I'm not a creative writer. Mm. So I don't think I, I no, mean, it's up not to Not as me a to writer, say. but as an observer, as an insider, as an objective outsider. We should, uh, I know that right now in Bhutan we are looking at employment mm. and we are going more on mathematics and mm. digital STEM. STEM. Mm. Of course, but the country is also its culture. Mm, of course. And either private people or the government, but if the government can do it, we should have private people to do it, have an institution mm. for literature, mm. where people can come in the evening, get creative writing lessons in Zonka and, and in English, English, have an editor, make maybe some, somebody come from abroad, get a certificate for editing, something which is more, maybe more academic, Mm. but which will help, and screenwriting also, Mm. Mm. something which will help the Bhutanese to really contribute to their culture and to the world. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's that's my feeling. That's what we are really needing. It's nice to have festival. It's nice to have independent author. But at the same time, if we want Bhutan to be more on the international scene, we have to up our aims Mm -hmm. and improve our aims and have a kind of institution which could be uh, a kind of school, school Mm -hmm. for writing, Mm -hmm. like they have in Mm -hmm. the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what uh, really strikes a chord with me is to write, you cannot just pull out ideas out of the air, you have to read. Oh, 
Absolutely. You have to read, you have to acknowledge great writers, you have to learn, you know, appreciate the language of these writers. So reading, reading, reading is the most important thing. But now, um, can you tell us when this book is going to be available for the, uh, you know, the common reader? Can you just show your book? Okay. Will it be I, here for the launch of the... Sir, Stephanie should be at my back or holding mm. the book with me. Thank you, Stephanie, for mm. pushing me out of my comfort zone. Exactly. We pushed each other. Uh, the book is available now on, on in the US in all the good libraries, mm -hmm. uh, bookshops, okay. sorry, okay. and in the libraries. You can download it. It's av available on Amazon, US, Canada, Europe, anywhere. India, Amazon India also. Oh, great. And uh, you can download it on, uh, as Kindle uh, mm. book. Mm. You can get it from Shambhala, of course. Mm. But it's not the same as to have the real book to download it. Mm. So for people who are not digital nomads, uh, it's coming hopefully to Timpu, hopefully as uh, some of the bookshops here are interested to get it from India because it is in India. Mm -hmm. So, with the um, Penguin and? Oh, the distribution all over the world of Shambhala is Penguin and Random House. So, so it's well distributed mm -hmm. and you shouldn't have. And I'm happy because it is not expensive. Mm. Mm -hmm.